belk and stuff there, you know, that uh, does all that. Yeah. But I might have. Uh, I'll just have to check. Right, well, good evening. In case you don't know, welcome to Calvary Chapel of Susanville. For those of you online, let's pray. Lord, we ask that tonight you would pour out your spirit. You would meet each individual, Lord, wherever we are. Meet us where we're at. Lord, speak to us based on <laughs> not what we think we need. Lord, speak to us on what you know we need to hear. Lord, uh, we love you, and I pray that we would each surrender in <laughs> complete submission. Lord, surrender totally to you, to your word. Have your way, in Jesus' name, amen. If you're able, let's go ahead and stand for this song. Show us your glory. Show us, show us your 
Gracious Father, we're here tonight, Lord, to meet with you. And we ask, Lord, that you would just meet us where we're at, that you would reveal yourself to us afresh, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would draw us into yourself, and that truly you'd be pleased, that you'd be glorified in this place. Have your way in our midst, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Well, welcome in Jesus' name. You can be seated. Welcome to everybody listening on the radio and on Facebook and stuff. A uh, couple quick announcements. I'm looking forward to this Sunday uh, for a lot of reasons, but uh, it's going to be a great study. I know that. But uh, on top of that, we're having a baptism after the second service, and so we're going to have a barbecue potluck and then a time of worship and baptism and stuff. It's going to be great. And so bring a lawn chair, bring a, a side dish or something like that, and a, an appetite uh, for God's Word and for some good food. And so uh, it's going to be it's gonna be fun. we got like, I don't know, six or seven or eight kids are going to get baptized, and uh, several adults as well. And so, and if you want to get baptized, you know, just come talk to me and we'll, we'll hash it out. Also, uh, on the 19th, which is the following Saturday, I think. Yeah, it's the uh, women's, uh, uh, single women's fellowship dinner uh, here at church at four o'clock. And so, uh, there's a sign up on the counter for that. Then we got the men's breakfast coming up on the 26th. And again, there's a sign up for that too. And then, uh, September 11th is the women's conference we've been talking about. And we'll try and get some more information out about that and uh, a lot of cool stuff. So I say jump in there. Also, I haven't uh, figured out the exact date yet, uh, but in July, we're going to start a men's study uh, in the evenings, uh, Tuesday evenings, probably like about six o'clock or so. And we're going to go through uh, Living by the Word, which is a book on inductive study. And so it's really a good book and uh, it'd be a great study. We're going to get a workbook to go with it and stuff. And so... Uh, looking forward to that. So guys, kind of be praying about whether you can come to it on Tuesday nights. Father God, thank you so much for your love and your kindness. Uh, thank you, Lord, for blessing us. Help us, Lord, to hear your voice tonight. Help us to worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship.
Hallelujah to you.
Lord, we sing out hallelujah because we know what we have been saved from. And we just want to praise the Lord. Lord, we praise you for who you are, for being so good, for being so kind. Lord, your, your loving kindness is just overwhelming. We just want to say we love you. Let's all stand for this last song. right now. are higher than ours. We trust him, Lord. Deep. 
to be here. It's his will to study his word. Lord, we thank you. We rest in that promise that where we're gathered, you are here. Pour out your spirit, Lord. We trust your ways. We trust you leading us because we know, Lord, your ways are higher than ours. So we sing, you are perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are. Declare that right now. Gracious Father, we acknowledge that where we find our identity in you, Lord, as you love us, as we love you back, well, that's who we really are, Lord, and we, we're glad, Lord, to, to know you. We're glad, Lord, that you know us and that we have that relationship with you. And Lord, we pray that you would, again, Lord, speak to us tonight, pour out, Lord, your spirit upon us and help us to hear your voice. And help, you, help us, Lord, to worship you with our hearts and with our minds. We love you so much, Lord. We want you to be pleased. Be glorified this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome in Jesus' name. Why don't you turn and say hello. 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 <laughs> hey, Frank. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm glad to be here with you guys tonight. Uh, between the uh, Sunday morning study and the fundamentals of the faith and then going through James, uh, we're getting a lot of uh, practical stuff on what it is to be a Christian and what that looks like. And so uh, looking forward to kind of working our way through this chapter. We're not going to finish it tonight, but we'll uh, knock out a, about a third of it. So uh, if you will, open up your Bibles to James uh, chapter 1. And once you get your Bible open, if you're able, uh, would you stand with me? in reverence for God's word as we read it together. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, it says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. Uh, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for you doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. And let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, for he is double-minded man. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with the burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted uh, by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But it but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every gift, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures, uh, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and the overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and, and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, uh, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks uh, he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Gracious Father, help us to hear your voice tonight. Help us, Lord, to, to, to comprehend you correctly, Lord, and, and, and to be doers of your word, not just hearers, but to apply it, Lord, to our lives. Help us, Lord, by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And amen. You guys can be seated. So we go from verse 8, uh, describing a double-minded man who is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man has a divided heart. And, you know, uh, part this and part that, not really quite sure, not really committed, if you will, uh, to doing the will of God, kind of no matter what it takes. But then he gets right into verse 9 when he says, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, uh, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. And so when the lowly are elevated, as it says there uh, in verse 9, you know, uh, that literally is a gift from God. Uh, and, and that's who should be glorified. And we read in the Psalms, in, in Psalm 75, verses 6 and 7, uh, for exaltation comes neither from the, from the east nor from the west nor from the south, but God is his judge. He puts down one and exalts another. And so when you think about this, and, and I'm not sure how to approach this exactly, but when I was thinking about this, it came to me that we're all of low degree. We are all the lowly. I mean, God is high and lifted up, and we're all lowly, whether we realize it or not. Now, some have a, uh, an unrealistic view of themselves. They think that they're lofty. They think that they have you know, some intellectual prowess, or they think that they have power in life, or that their riches have done something for them. But God doesn't see it that way. God sees us all as just a bunch of dumb sheep. You know, and, and, and because of that, we're all in the same boat. It's just that some of us realize it more than others. And so we are all the lowly, if you will, that he's talking about here. Uh, we're all of low degree. But look at what, is, what God has done. He has elevated us to be called his children. 
I mean, that's pretty cool when you think about it. You know, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. We've been exalted to be called His children. What were we before that? We were just a bunch of pagans, man. We were just a bunch of knuckleheads, you know? And, and now we're called the children of the Most High God, servants of the Most High God. I mean, David said, you know, all I want to do in life is be a, a, in the house of the Lord, to, to behold His beauty. It's like he wanted to be a doorman in the house of the Lord. I can remember when I was a cop and, and, and I was enjoying life and, and enjoying my career, and I discovered the Lord. And all of a sudden, my life began to change. And I remember one day pushing a broom around Murrieta, which is the, the Bible college, the conference center at the time, and I was doing kind of basically janitorial work. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a cop by day and a janitor by night kind of thing, right? And, uh, and I just remember thinking one day, I could do this forever. I, I just want to serve the Lord. And if, if it's pushing a broom, cleaning toilets, I don't care. I just want to serve the Lord. Because to me, that's like the most exalted position that we can have in life is to know him. You know, we, we read in the Bible about, you know, let not the, the, the strong man glory in his strength and let not the rich man glory in his riches, but, but glory in this that you know me. You know, what a cool thing that is, just to, just to know the Lord. We have it up on a lot of people. There's a lot of people walking around in it, and I pray for them. I, you know, the non-believers in the world, it, it bothers me that so many people are going to hell, but I'm so glad I'm not. I'm so glad to know him. And so we've been exalted to be called his children. We read in John's gospel, in John chapter 1, verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children or, or sons of God to those who believe in his name. And it is such a privilege to have this relationship with him. It, it's such a privilege to be a believer. And, you know, I think there's a lot of people out there that are believers that don't realize the, 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 what they've got in their hand. You know, that they don't have an appreciation for the treasure that God has poured into these earthen vessels in the form of the Holy Spirit in the form of the breath of God that lives in us, that we are the temple of the living God. I mean, <laughs> pinch me. Is this real? <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, and so the lowly have been elevated. There are many who think more highly of themselves really than they ought. Uh, they, they consider themselves of high degree, uh, at least in their own minds, but, but God doesn't see it that way. In fact, Jesus declared at one point, in, in Matthew's gospel, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 30, he said, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. You know, things are going to get reversed. And this, this passage actually kind of describes that. You know, uh, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. It, he, like, wow, Lord, you lifted me up to be in this, this awesome place. But those that are haughty, those that are proud, we're going to be humbled. And, and that whether that's in eternity, you know, in hell, that final judgment, or whether it's in this life, we don't know. I'm not going to worry about that so much. I just want to make sure to avoid it. But it says, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he's going to pass away. And so the rich in his humiliation, the rich, the powerful, will be humbled or lowered. They will fade away like a flower under the heat of the sun. In verse 11, it says, no, for, for no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man uh, will also fade away in his pursuits. And so in a very similar way, the, the rich man's going to fade away just like that. And you think about the rich man, and, and it talks about his pursuits. What do rich men pursue? <laughs> more money, <laughs> more power, more this, more whatever. You know, and, and Jesus declared, he said, you know, if you, to the woman at the well, if you, if you continue to drink from this well, you will thirst again. But I'll give you water that will flow from you that, that you'll never thirst again. You'll always be content, always be satisfied. I'm not sure which one of the, the rich robber barons it was back in the uh, early 1900s. But somebody asked him, I think it was J.P. Morgan or somebody, you know, he was like a gazillionaire. And he goes, well, how much, more did you, how much more money do you want to make? And he told the interview, just a little more. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, I look at guys that are, you know, good billionaires and it's like, really? Are you ever going to spend that much money in your lifetime? And it's like, but they want more. And that's sad because the rich men will continue to pursue worldly riches. And, and, and I think really this passage in some respect is kind of describing the folly or the futility of riches or perhaps the pursuit of it. 
Paul writes to Timothy in, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. He says, But those who desire to be rich fall into, into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know, it's money in and of itself isn't evil. It's the pursuit of it. It's the lust after it. It's, it's the things that people will do seemingly to get it. And, and, and that's what is harmful, and people have pierced themselves through. Jesus declared in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, he said, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other, but you cannot serve God and mammon. We have to decide who we're going to serve. Now, I think there's lots of people out there that have the gift of being able to be wealthy, if you will, but it doesn't control them. They, they hold it with an open hand. God's blessed them with the, the, the wealth or whatever, but he's also blessed them with the ability to keep things in the right order. I don't, you know, he hasn't blessed me with that. That's why I'm not rich. <laughs> but the bottom line is that, you know, we have to have one master, and it's going to have to be the Lord Jesus. In fact, in Matthew chapter 19, verses 23 and 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, I surely say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And, you know, I, and I've heard people do the teaching, you know, well, they, they had a, a little gate and it was called the eye of the needle and they had to make the camel kneel down and crawl through it. I don't know if that's true or not, but what I do know is what Jesus said literally was, it's hard for rich guys to get to heaven because so many rich guys count on their riches and depend on that. And, you know, I know I, personally when I'm broke, I pray a lot more. <laughs> you know, when I'm, when I'm in that place of, you know, when I have a real need, my prayer life kind of perks up. And, uh, and, and, and so I think it's a good thing at times to, to have that place. Jesus asked the question for, in, Ma in Matthew 16, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? There are those, again, that have been gifted by God with wealth and have also been gifted by God to keep it all in the right perspective. And there are those who have been honestly blinded by their wealth. And in reality, that their wealth has become a curse to them. I haven't seen it in a long time, but a while back, I saw an article about all the different people that have won the lottery in California. And you, know, you think, if I told you, hey, today you've got you know, 10 million bucks or 20 million bucks, you know, we'd whoo -hoo, you know, took your heels and out the door you go, right? And it's like, we'd think that'd be a great thing. But most of the people that have won the lottery have ended up destitute after a certain period of time. They've been taken advantage of, they, they had squandered it, all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and they, they discovered that the wealth was not such a blessing after all. In fact, you know, it's kind of weird, but there's a lot of rich people, a lot of famous people, movie stars, that kind of stuff, that commit suicide every year. And you think, man, you know, uh, if money was the end all, then, then why would they do that? Because money's not the end all. Jesus is the end all, you know, a relationship with him. But, um, you know, uh, um, thinking of uh, the rich man and Lazarus, you know, that rich man would gladly have traded with Lazarus if he could have to have his position at the end of things than, than during the life. You know, he wanted so much to be, to be uh, comforted. Makes me glad in a sense not to have that problem. I really respect what the writer of Proverbs tells us in Proverbs chapter 30, uh, beginning at verse 7. It says, Two things I request of you, deprive me not before I die. Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. <clears throat> Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. He's kind of laying out kind of a balance, you know, that you would have just what you need, to take care of your basic needs, but not too much where you kind of forget where it came from. I, I, as a student of the Old Testament, and, and as you guys, as we went through Judges together, when did Israel really flourish? When did they really cry out to God? When did they, when did they get, in a sense, spiritual? So often it was when they were oppressed. So often it was when they had great need, and, and God would answer their prayers. But when did they fall? When did they have the hardest time walking with the Lord, if you will, in their prosperity? You know, that's why the Laodicean church suffered so much. 
you know, and that's why I, I consider the church in America today to be the Laodicean church because we're, we're fat, dumb, and happy, blind, and naked, and we don't even know it, you know, and, and, and we're living a, we've got this dream life that's distracted us away from the things of the Lord. And so it, it's, you know, we're like that frog that's being slowly boiled. We've got to be so diligent to stay on top of things. Most of us probably don't have to worry about being too rich, but all of us at times, I think, have been challenged financially, as this passage kind of points out. And whether it's, you know, you didn't have enough money to pay your bills or, you know, you were challenged like you've got money now, do you tithe or not? Different things. But finances could be a challenge in a number of ways. But verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Well, that word blessed in, in the Greek language is makarios, and it means happy is the man who has the favor of God. And that is so true. You know, I, I pray all the time, Lord, would you give me favor today? you know, in, in whatever I'm building or when I'm studying or the different things that I'm applying myself to. Lord, would you grant me your favor? Would you bless me today? And, and I don't, I'm not ashamed to say that I pray that a lot, but it, it's a state of being marked by or having the fullness of God in your life. I love that. You know, some of my, uh, my best times in the Lord have been the most challenging, whether it's financially or relationally or different things going on, but you know what? When you know that you're right with God and walking in his ways and seeking to please him, it's kind of like the rest of life almost doesn't matter. You know, it's like you just kind of keep plugging away. But that word blessed or makarios, uh, according to Zodiades, it indicates the state of a believer in Christ, speaking of one who, is, who becomes a partaker of God's nature through faith in Christ. The believer who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit because of Christ and as a result should be fully satisfied no matter what the circumstances. When you're content in Christ, it's amazing how everything else in life just kind of falls in place. That's why Jesus told us, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Make him the first priority in life. And it's amazing how everything else will just kind of fall in place. And so that's the idea. But, but, but think about this for a minute. You know, verse 2 starts out with, you know, count it all joy when you fall into, you know, various trials. And, and, and at first, some of us might even scoff at that, like, really? Come on. You know, be joyful about it. But, but then you get here, and it says, well, blessed is the man who endures the temptation. And, and we, we see the, the blessing in it, but you could almost kind of say that the, the outlook determines outcome. When you go into it with a good attitude... You're waiting for that blessing to become apparent, and God never fails. You know, then it says, <clears throat> blessed is the man who endures temptation. The word endure there is a hupomino, which means to persevere or to bear up under adversity, uh, to, to, to withstand the pressure, if you will, or the temptation. I like what Spurgeon said once. He said, Lord, you know, don't lighten my load. Give me a stronger back. You know, and it's like, don't, don't make it easier, Lord. Sometimes making it easier makes it worse. Sometimes it prolongs a trial or a thing that we're going through. And we've got to be careful not to circumvent what God is doing because God's not going to give us more than we can handle. But he, but he, what he does allow to come to us, he, he allows for a purpose. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, Paul writes that there's no temptation which has taken you except as such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. I remember being <clears throat> in high school football and not being a believer in like that, but I just remember for the first time having a coach make me run more than I thought I could run. I, I ran cross-country and track before I was in football, so I had some good lungs. I could, I could run for miles and miles and miles. But all of a sudden, now I'm on the football team, and this coach is making me run a 40-yard dash, you know, sprints back and forth. And I'm running up and down the bleachers and stuff, and I feel like my lungs are going to explode. And I think I'm just about dead and gone. He goes, no, do another one. And I'm thinking, I can't do it. And he, he starts yelling. In fact, he actually kicked me a couple times, you know, and got me going in, a, in the butt. And, uh, and, uh, and, and I, I did. I ran. I, I kept going. I couldn't believe there was more. He knew there was more when I thought I was all done. And how often we think we're done. It's like, okay, I can't take any more, God. He goes, oh, yeah, you're good for like about two more miles. You just don't know it. 
And so it's the understanding that, that God knows better than we do what we're capable of. And he will sometimes allow us to be pushed to the limit, not so that he'll know it, but so that we'll know it. So that we get under, the understanding of his presence and, and trust him in, the, in these different scenarios. We're told as well, when it talks about uh, enduring temptation, later on in James, we're going to read in James 4, 7, therefore submit to God, but he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And so those temptations are going to come. God's going to allow that. Uh, he's not going to allow it to be worse, though, or more than we're actually capable of handling. And we can actually exercise uh, some, some, some power in this situation. We have the ability to resist the enemy. Now, what's, the, what, what's that mean to resist him? <clears throat> it doesn't mean you've got to knock him out. It doesn't mean that you've got to tackle him or conquer him. It just means all you have to do is say no. <laughs> no, I'm not having it. You know, and trust that the Lord will fight that battle for you. You know, when God created man in the garden, we were created, or man was created innocent, not righteous. We talked about this on Sunday. And there's a difference between innocence and righteousness. Righteousness is the preservation of innocence in, in the face of temptation. And, you know, I have stumbled. We've probably all stumbled. But, you know, God strengthens us. We are no longer slaves to sin. You know, before we knew the, Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, before we had the Holy Spirit living in us, we were literally slaves to sin. And, you know, you may or may not have realized it, but we gave into it all the time. And, and, and temptation is so often that the testing that we all go through in our life, uh, our lives are the testing, which when we finish the race, that crown of life is waiting for us. That's our reward. In fact, Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 4, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there's later for me the, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, not to me only, but to all who love his appearing. Remember, <clears throat> remember our Lord's exhortation and his promise to the church in Smyrna. You know, in the seven letters to the seven churches, Smyrna was the persecuted church. Smyrna was the church that got, you know, in a sense, their clock cleaned. And in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, Jesus makes a promise to them. He says, do not fear any of those things which, are about, which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil's about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And, and you will have tribulation, it says, for 10 days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. I can't help but read this passage. I wonder if that's going to be us someday. I wonder if, you know, it's going to come our way. And he's saying, you know what? I want you to be faithful. I want you to endure this. I want you to bring glory to my name and trust me that I'll take care of you to the end. But as it says, there's a little caveat. It says, blessed is the man who endures temptation for, he is, for when he has been approved or tested or tried, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord promised to those that love him, to those that love him. And our, our love for him, our commitment to him will likely be tested. You know, I, I don't honestly think that we can make any kind of promise to God. You know, God, I love you so much. I'll never forsake you. I'll always walk in your ways. Those kinds of things will always be challenged by the enemy. They, they, you, you will be tested in that. And that's just part of the Christian life. That's just kind of how it goes. But, but we're told here to those that love him, they're the ones that are going to receive that crown. And I want to just say that love is the critical ingredient here. Love is the only acceptable motive if, if we endure because we're just trying to be, you know, show other people that we're tough, <laughs> wrong. If we endure because we're trying to do some kind of religious obligation, that's not, not going to fly either. Our motive for doing these things has to be that we love him. <clears throat> Otherwise, it's really kind of just an empty religious observance. You know, the, it, it's, it's not acceptable really uh, in his sight. And so love is the critical ingredient. And I guess... There's times when we are tested, not so that we'll know how much we love God, um, that, that God will know how much we love him, but that we will know how much we love him. Because there's times when we're, we're tempted by things, and it's like God or this. And we think, oh, I'll never do that. But then all of a sudden, we find ourselves doing the other thing. You know, we realize that, you know, we're not as faithful as we thought. We're not as spiritual as we thought. I mean, that's been my life for the last 35 years, is I keep thinking that I'm spiritual, that I'm something, and God allows me, every time I kind of get to that place, that's when I lose my temper and blow it. You know, that's when I do something stupid or say something foolish. 
and in front of people usually. I always have witnesses when I do something stupid, you know. <laughs> and it's amazing, but it's it's not so much that God wants to embarrass me, but He wants me to see where I am, and and to have that, you know, because God requires truth in the inward parts. But I guess the question might be, how do you know if you really love Him or not? I mean, we make those professions, and sometimes it is that emotional kind of part of us that, Lord, I love you, I love you with all my heart. But sometimes he allows those testings to come into our lives that we could see where we're at. In, in uh, 1 John chapter 5, the first few verses, it says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who has begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So I see two different things in this short little passage that are kind of a criteria, if you will, or a, a way of understanding or knowing if we really love God or not. And it, we, if we really love God, it says here, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who was begotten. That means we love other believers. <laughs> You know, John chapter 13, verse 35, by this will all men know that you're my disciples indeed if you have love one for another. And so that's kind of one of the criteria <clears throat> of being a Christian. You have to love other people. And, and if you come to that point, well, I got to love you, so I'll just be nice to you today and not knock your block off. You know, well, you, you might do it begrudgingly, but God wants to do it with a willing heart that we actually genuinely love people. But you know what? There's a bunch of unlovable people out there. I met a couple, <laughs> you know, <laughs> And, and you know what? There are times when you just got to just suck it up, buttercup, and go, you know what? <clears throat> the way I'm going to show you love today is I'm not going to kill you. <laughs> the way I'm going to show you love today is, you know, I'm going to turn the other cheek. You know, when you say something, you know, unpleasant or derogatory or whatever. I mean, there's different ways of showing love that it manifests itself. But we have to do it because we love him. And he loves us. And so one of the criteria for loving knowing that you love God is that you love other people. And <clears throat> if you're here to, this evening and you go, well, I love some people, but not very many of them or whatever, you know, I kind of pick and choose as I go. We all struggle with that, but we have to just say, Lord, give me the love to love with. I don't have the love. I can't conjure it up. But God, if, he'll meet you where you're at. Lord, help me to love. And if you begin to pray for yourself to be a more loving person, I've been praying that for a long time. I've, I've been praying that, Lord, it would look like I love people if nothing else. You know, you put a smile on my face and, and help me to be cheerful and, and welcoming to people, you know, and, uh, and, and help me, Lord. Because people, sometimes people look at me and they go, I don't know, you know, whatever. <laughs> they go, that's not a loving Christian. They go, Lord, help me to be a loving Christian. Help me to, 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 to minister to people. But the second criteria in this passage is that we would be, as, as James would put it, doers of his word. That we would be obedient to his commandments. That we would, I mean, examine your life. Are you, are you, is your life in conformity to God's word or is it, you know, the other way around? You know, or does, is our life characterized by being obedient to God's word or is it characterized by being disobedient to God's word? I mean, it, it's kind of one of these self-check kinds of things. I, I don't want, I, it's not my job to point out anybody else's sin, but I think each of us could examine our own life and, and, and ask by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, help me to see where I'm at. And, Lord, I need a report card. <laughs> He'll give you a report card. <laughs> but you won't have to have it signed by your parents or your pastor, praise God. But, you know, sometimes it hurts. I'll be straight up with you. He'll, he'll let you get into circumstances where you see how obedient or unobedient, disobedient we are. <clears throat> and so a couple of basic things there. But the trials of life, the temptations which were to count as joy, bring not only spiritual maturity... But as we see here, it also brings the crown of life, the reward at the end. And so blessed is the man who endures temptation, the testing of our faith, that man will receive the crown of life. Verse 13 says, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. And so continuing on, obviously, about you know, temptation, the bottom line is that God doesn't tempt anyone. You know, don't blame God if you, you know, you, you, know you, you fail the test, so to speak. Don't blame God if you succumb to temptation. Well, God, you know, no, it's not God's fault. 
You know, people are very quick to blame God. You know, a hurricane comes through. It was an act of God. I don't think so. God allowed it, but it was the prince of the power of the air that, that whipped that wind up and all that stuff. God doesn't tempt anyone. The enemy does that, but only as God allows. Remember, as we read in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, God will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able. He, he doesn't tempt us, but as the enemy comes in and, and wants to probably do a lot more, God goes, no, just this much. Remember with Job, when the enemy says, you know, Job only loves you because you bless him. Okay, take away the blessing, but don't, don't touch him. Then he, he, he took away the blessing, destroyed all of his stuff. He came, well, he only loves you because you protect him. Well, I'll tell you what, you can afflict him, but you can't kill him. And then Job came through that test, actually, I think, with flying colors. I mean, he had a hard time. But, uh, you know, you read 50, so 50 or so chapters on, you know, hammer, hammer, hammer. And at the end, you know, God blesses him double and is glorified in his behavior. And, and I guess the question we might ask, is God or would God be glorified in our trials? Would we allow God to be glorified? Would we go through it with a smile on our face just so that God would be glorified? And I, and I think that's a powerful statement. That's a powerful testimony. But <clears throat> God doesn't tempt anyone. You know, when you go to Genesis chapter 3, we talked about this a little bit on, on Sunday, when the enemy came to Eve <clears throat> and began to question God's word and question God's character and all those things, the word temptation isn't used in that passage, but we see that there is a temptation presented that this, you know, that you'll be like God. You know the difference between good and evil and all these different things. And, and, and so the, the tempter comes in and gives a temptation. And, and it's interesting because uh, we see that who it's presented by is presented by Satan. And, it, and he is the tempter. In, in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, then again in verse 3, it says, when Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And then in verse 3 it says, now when the tempter had come. God doesn't tempt anyone, but you know what? The tempter sure does. That's why he gets that title. And he's always tempting people. He's always trying to get people to get tripped up. Paul refers to him the same way in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5. Paul refers to the devil as, quote, unquote, the tempter. But just like with Job, God only allows the enemies to do so much. Otherwise, I think we'd be toast. It, you know, if God just turned the enemy loose, he would kill us. He, or he would lead us to kill each other and, or ourselves, you know. <clears throat> but the bottom line is God puts a, a governor on him, if you will. Uh, and again, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. We don't always know what we're ab able. You know, we don't know what we're capable of, I think, in either direction. <clears throat> but bear in mind, so often the trials that we experience in life are an opportunity to grow, but they're not intended for us to demonstrate how faithful we are, quite honestly. They're intended for us to see how faithful God is. Because I know how faithful I am. And the minute you think you're faithful, you're not. <laughs> the minute you think you're something, you know, pride becomes poor or fall. I, I don't want to go there. When I get into those places, say, Lord, preserve me. You know, I, I pray it all the time because I, I see smart people, eloquent people, gifted pastors and teachers, all that kind of stuff, and, and they, they fall like, you know, uh, like the rain. And I say, Lord, that guy's so smart and brilliant. What hope do I have? He goes, me. <laughs> he, is, he is our only hope. He's the one that keeps us. It, it's not about our faithfulness. It's about his. It's about, not about the work that we would do. It's about the work that he has done. And so it's always about his glory. You know, he's not, not glorified if we, can, if we can, in a self-righteous kind of way, say, well, I did this. But if I say, Lord, I am a, I'm a weakling, I'm a foolish man, and I need your help. Would you help me? And then he helps me. Then he gets the glory. And that's what these trials so often are all about. In, in verse 14, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And so sadly, we do have a role in our own temptation. Perhaps it's our weakness being revealed. It's our lust and our desires being revealed. And it's our connection to the world oftentimes. You know, I want to say that I live, uh, you know, a selfless life. But if you watch me eat a bowl of ice cream and, you know, sit down in my easy chair and, you know, take it easy on a night or whatever, you know, you would see pretty quickly that, no, that's not the case. 
you know, we are, we are weak, foolish individuals and we have desires and different things. And the idea is that we would somehow let our desires die, that we would be dead men walking in a certain sense, dead to the world, but alive in the spirit. And <clears throat> when these different things that tempt us do actually succeed, it, it, it's because it was already in us to begin with. And it, it, the flesh, if you will, wasn't quite mortified. You know, we, we, we put ourselves on that altar, Lord, I'm a living sacrifice to you. And just about the time the flames start licking at us, we roll off, whoop, that hurt too much, I'll see you later. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and all of a sudden that living sacrifice is running down the road versus laying on the altar. <laughs> and so we got to guard against that. You know, we're warned, uh, we're, we're told in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, he says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. That's one of the things about our faith. I know that uh, you know faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. I won't ever kind of underplay, if you will, the role that the Word of God has uh, in our lives. But I'll tell you something. If you make it a point to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only, if you make it a point to abide in Christ and seek to apply what you learn in Bible study and your Bible reading and all those different things, God will become more and more real to you and your, your faith will be strengthened in ways that you, you would never imagine. And, and it works out just that way because, but he who does the will of God abides forever. When we, we, when we purpose to do the things that please God, we are literally abiding in him. And he says, we will abide forever. Uh, forever is like one of those eternal kind of terms that you'll make it to the end. You, you won't falter. You'll, you'll, get, you'll hit the finish line. And that's the goal. We don't always start off so hot. You know, I remember some guys that, you know, used to start off those two-mile cross-country races. Man, and they would just, you know, boom, they're gone. And it looked great for about the first quarter mile, half a mile, or even a mile. And then as you're kind of just gliding on by when you're, <laughs> when you're sucking wind, you know, because they, they, you know, not that we have to pace ourselves, but it isn't how you start that matters, it's how you finish. And we all want to finish well. We all want to be good witnesses to the end. Knowing as well, as Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to preserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. But God knows how to sustain us. I'm glad, as Jude tells us in Jude uh, verse 24, that, that he's the one that keeps us. He's the one that sustains us. And that's why I keep looking to him for strength and for energy and understanding. But check out um, Romans chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Here it says, Do not uh, let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. But the idea here is do not let sin reign in your mortal body, uh, that you should obey it in its lust. This implies that we have a choice. We can resist. You know, and, you know, I know I've mentioned 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 a couple of times so far as references in this, in this study. But if I had a least favorite verse in the Bible, that's it. I mean, you ask me my favorite verse, I can tell you my favorite verse, I can tell you a bunch of other really cool verses. But if you said, Mike, what's your least favorite verse in the Bible? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, because it haunts me. <laughs> because it, it says we have a choice. We have the ability to, choose, to make the right choice, to escape sin. And the fact of the matter in my life is there's so many times when I just didn't. I didn't take the out. I didn't take the, 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 the escape hatch. I went ahead and just did the stupid thing when I didn't really have to. I just was being lame. And, and because we have the choice. It, it is our choice. We are no longer slaves to sin. Before we had the Holy Spirit living in us, we were slaves to sin. We just naturally did the dumb thing and, and had no way of not doing the dumb thing. But when we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, we become the temple of the living God. We actually have the, the dunamis, the, the, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ living in us. And we have the ability just to resist and to say no and to, to turn near the way, to walk in the spirit, to neither lust the flesh, all these things. We have that ability. The power's there. 
And all we've got to do is just say, no. I can't tell me, you, you guys relate to this. You're on your computer, I'm, I'm doing a Bible study, and some kind of clickbait comes on the, on the thing, some kind of teaser thing that you look at that and kind of go, hmm, and you hit the little X and it goes away. Or you can hit the other thing and it blows up. And it's like, I'm like any other guy. I, I see that come up and go, oh. You know, and it's not like, oh, is my wife looking? Okay, no. <laughs> no? Who's going to walk in the room? I don't know. doesn't matter because God's given us the ability just to say, nope, see you later, alligator. And you resist the enemy and walk away from it. And, and, and God gives us the ability to do that. And again, we have the choice. We're no longer slaves to sin. I love what Paul writes to the Galatians. I quoted it a moment ago, but in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What's it mean to walk in the Spirit? I mean, that's, I love what Paul says, but literally, practically, what's it mean to walk in the Spirit? Well, I think first off, you've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, have Jesus living in us, if you will, the Holy Spirit residing in us. And then you need to cultivate that. And for me, and I'm just being, you know, uh, throwing out a couple things here, but for me, part of walking in the Spirit is to be engaged in spiritual things, singing praises to him, worshiping God, reading my Bible, you know, spending time in communion with him in prayer, and you know, intercession and supplication, all different, different aspects of prayer. We're going to talk about prayer on Sunday. Uh, it, it, it means you know, being in fellowship with other believers. And, and it means trying, like, Lord, I know I can't earn my righteousness, but I love you and I want to please you. What can I do for you today? What would you put in front of me? Or, or what do we know to be obedient to? I mean, to whom much is given, much is required. And, and if you've been a student of the Bible for any period of time, you're reading it, you know there are certain do's and certain don'ts in life. We want to just abide by that. And again, to please him, not, not because we a religious obligation or a, a fear or, or you know being compelled in some way, but just because we want to please him. And so walking in the Spirit is kind of a, a conglomeration of things. It, but it adds up to, I mean, when I talk to people that have uh, fallen away from the Lord or fallen into sin or they're, they're dealing with different things, the symptomology is almost always the same. And one of the first things they do is they, they, they kind of start sliding on, their, on their, their Bible reading and they stop coming to church. They're no longer accountable, no longer in fellowship. They haven't spent much time in prayer. You know, and these are basic, simple, Simon things that Christians do not again out of religious obligation, but because I love the Lord, I want to hear His voice today. You know, when I get up in the morning and I do my devotions, I'm not just kind of going, okay, i got to knock out four chapters today and five pages and get through the Bible in a year. And, you know, I'm not thinking about like a checklist. I'm thinking my prayer is, Lord, would you speak to me today? And sometimes that might be five chapters or it might be five words. <laughs> because sometimes you can get hooked up you know, where you're, you're, you're reading through a passage, you're just going through your Bible reading, and maybe you get half a sentence into it, but the Holy Spirit grabs your heart, and all of a sudden, you know, it blows your mind, and you spend an hour and a half looking at five words. <laughs> that's just a valid, I mean, that's a valid devotion as opposed to getting through five chapters. It's not, you know, uh, quantity time, it's quality time. But those kinds of things add up to Walking in the Spirit, because it, it, it impacts us, it, it, it strengthens us. And the more we exercise our will in saying a decisive no to temptation, the more God will take control of our lives. I have prayed many a time, and, and you know, God's kind of <laughs> said no in a way, I, I, you still have to choose. But I said, God, will you just completely take over? Make me a robot. Make me a Christian robot. I don't care, Lord. Just get me to the end. You know, when people scream at me or flip me off, just say, praise the Lord, you know, whatever. And just give me kind of a, a robotic, you know, answer. He goes, no. I, I want you to walk through this, and I want you to love me through this, because I'm going to love you through it. And I want to change you, but I don't want to force you into anything. But Lord, I'm, I want you to force me. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to do it that way. You know, and, but I do know, as Paul says to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, for it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Anybody here besides me had a hard time forgiving somebody for something? I've had that problem many times. 
You know, and, and, you know, it's like it happened 15 years ago, but I'm in the shower this morning thinking about it, and I'm going down the drain just as fast as the water is because I'm thinking about this thing and how I should have answered, and, you know, I want to have that argument all over again because this time I win, <laughs> you know, like that kind of stuff. And it's like, no, Lord, don't let me go there. And, and, I, and I love that, that when we yield our lives to him and, and seek to be obedient to him and say, Lord, I, I just want to yield this to you, that God works in you to will to do his good pleasure. And there's been many a time when I've, 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 I've mouthed the words, you know, I forgive them, I, it's not a big deal anymore, but I find myself two days later kind of steamed up about it or whatever, you know, and I said, Lord, would you give me the forgiveness to forgive with? Would you help, would you change my will? Would you change my heart and help me to be more like you and less like me? Because that's what we need. And, and I want to be conformed to his image, but I want him to do that good work in me. And so... We have to be willing to be willing, if you will. In verse 15, he says, kind of continuing along the lines of uh, temptation, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, which is full grown, brings forth death. And it's funny, if we, if we don't deal with the sin issues, if we don't deal with uh, the temptations or the lusts or whatever, it'll kill us. It'll always grow. It has to be dealt with in a biblical way. And, and if, the way I think about it in my own mind is if, if I don't kill it, it will kill me. This is a fight to the death. And the enemy's, <laughs> the enemy's a student of our behavior. He knows us. And so we have to deal with it biblically because you can't take a knife to it. You can't take an atomic bomb to it. You can't take a flamethrower you know, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God. And so we, when we take these spiritual weapons and we say, Lord, help me. And it's amazing how he does. But sin usually, almost always, starts out as a thought. Okay? It's something conceived in our mind, and it's a thought that we either, you know, give time to or whatever, um, or we, we chuck it. But it starts out as a thought, and what we do with that thought determines the outcome. That's why you read in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3, 4, and 5, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. There are times when we have to rein ourselves in. You, you realize you're thinking about something you shouldn't be thinking about? Say, Lord, I mean, maybe nobody in the world knows about it. My wife and I have this thing where every now and then, you know, we're riding along in the car or, or somewhere, and maybe we're both quiet for a moment. She goes, so what are you thinking about? That's a panicky kind of a scenario. <laughs> Do you really want to know? Because <laughs> I don't really want to tell you all the time, you know? But we have thoughts that we know are not right, and we need to take that captive and make it a point to think about something else. You know, one of the points of spiritual warfare is that the enemy is a shooting arrows at you, and, and maybe you start to get depressed, or maybe you start to get angry. Anybody ever just got angry for no reason? I mean, you're having a good day, the birds are chirping, the whole thing, and on a dime, all of a sudden, you could kill the next person you see, and you're dealing with anger? That is spiritual warfare. Or, or you get depressed for no reason. That is spiritual warfare. Or maybe you've got a hundred reasons. It's still spiritual warfare. And we need to take our thoughts captive and get our eyes back on Jesus and seek after him. And so we can determine what we think about. And there's been many a time in my life when I was just thinking about the wrong thing the wrong way. You know, and, and, and maybe I was thinking about the perfect crime or I was thinking about stuff I read in the news or who knows what. There's times when i got to make it a point to turn my mind away from the things of this world and put my mind back on Jesus. I, um, I'm not typically, a, I don't think anyway, a, a depressed kind of person. I, I, I'm not that I know of. Some people might differ, but I'm not psychotic or you know, that kind of stuff. But I've been driving down the road before and had the thought, just turn your truck into that semi, you know, going the other way. I've had those thoughts. 
And it's like, what? I mean, I mean, and when I have a thought like that, I realize where it's coming from. Who wants to destroy me? The enemy. And, and he's choom, 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 shooting a dart at me, right? So the only way I've been able to figure this out, and, I, and, I, and actually I stole this from John Corson, but when the enemy shoots a fiery dart at me, just like when I was a fight in the PD, you hit me once, heaven help you, because I'm not going to hit you just once. And when, when that warfare comes and someone shoots an arrow at me, I shoot 10 back. And how do I shoot arrows back at the enemy? Lord, would you help my son today? Lord, would you bless John today? Lord, would you bless Brian? And I begin to pray for all the men and the marriages and, and different people in our fellowship by name. And, I, and they shoot a dart at me, and I boom, I start shooting them back. And it's pretty amazing how quickly the enemy stops shooting darts at you because he's getting hammered. And there's nothing worse than the enemy's eyes when a, when a Bible-believing, Jesus-loving, God-fearing Christian begins to pray. It's, the enemy has no defense against that. And so, like I said, I, I'm, I'm pretty aggressive in this. The best defense is a good offense. And so when the enemy shoots a dart at me, I start shooting them back, but I never give them back one. You know, I, I give back at least 10. And it's amazing how that changes because I want to bring my thoughts into captivity. And I can't help at times some of the thoughts that, that run through my little pea brain, but I can control where they go and how long they last, and I can cut that off. And, and God gives us the ability to do that. I, I, I've said this many times recently. I don't know why it keeps coming up, but we're, we're all told as kids, you know, change your attitude. <laughs> and the thing is, we can. God's given us the ability. We are no longer slaves to sin. We are slaves of righteousness. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit residing in us. And I think the dumbest thing we can do is let the enemy pummel us when we've got the ability to give it back, you know, twice over. And so we need to exercise the, the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. Again, we have to deal with sin in a biblical way. Uh, it, it's going to kill us if we don't. And so we've got to kill it. Because what Paul said is true. The wages of sin is death. But... The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, verse 16, it says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. In the King James, it says, Do not err. Don't make a mistake. Now, that's kind of high, high stress. Don't make a mistake. Uh-oh. <laughs> you know, you know. But he says, Don't be deceived. Here's the way that most people think. <clears throat> I think <clears throat> most people end up being deceived by thinking they're the exception. I've talked to people about, <clears throat> you know, sin, the things they're involved in. And they go, no, 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 you don't understand my situation. I go, no, I understand God's word. It says this is wrong. <laughs> and there are no exceptions to this. You know, we're so easily deceived. And we shouldn't think that we're the exception. Paul tells us in, in, in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, it says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. We've got to be careful not to think somehow that we're the exception to that rule uh, and, or that the wages of sin is not going to touch us. You know, um, it, it's foolishness. And, and for me, it's when he says in verse 16 again, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren, why would he even give us that warning? <laughs> because we're prone to being deceived. It's, a, it's an often repeated admonition, and I think for good reason. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, he said, Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. Uh, Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Do not be deceived. And then to the Galatians in Galatians 6, 7, we just read part of it, Do not be deceived. To the Ephesians, let no man deceive you. To the Thessalonians, let no man deceive you by any means. John writes in 1 John 3, 7, Little children, let no one deceive you. Why is he saying that all the time? Because there's a bunch of people trying to deceive you. Okay, the, the, the minions of the enemy. We live in, in an age of such incredible deceit, layers of deceit. And, and it, you start to scratch the surface, and it's like, I don't know how non-believers live, how they're even sane. I mean, when you hear about all the, the conspiracy stuff and the levels of bad things happening and all that kind of stuff, it would just drive me nuts if I, you know, I was going to heaven, if I didn't have my escape plan all set up. It's like, I, I remember as a non-believer discovering some of these things, 
And it, it partially terrified me, but it made me very depressed. Because you think, it's like, you know, the old, how do you fight City Hall? I don't know. All I know is how to fight the enemy. And, and that's with God's word. But, you know, we deceive ourselves, too. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, it says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We've got to be careful not to deceive ourselves as well. I came to the painful understanding and conclusion a long time ago that I'm way more gullible than I'd like to admit. <laughs> I have believed so many lies. I, I've, 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 I've believed uh, people and, uh, and things that have turned out not to be so, uh, turned out not to be true. And, um, and, and it bothers me. I remember being a cop. You know, people think the cops are clairvoyant or something, you know, like you just know. Sometimes people think the same thing about pastors. I play it every now and then, you know. People start talking to me about something, and I'll just stop. I, I used to have a down pat. I used to practice. I had this kind of like blank stare where I'd look at somebody, and I'd, I'd pause for effect give it like three or four or five seconds. And then really slowly I'd say, do you really expect me to believe that? And then I'd stare at them some more. And then two thirds of the time they just break down and confess whatever's going on. <laughs> but the whole time I'm thinking, I don't have a clue. <laughs> I wonder what that person is, is this real or not? And I'm thinking, I want to accuse this person of being a liar, but I don't have any real like a smoking gun or, you know, real good proof. And so you play psych psychological games and try and get them, you know, trick them into telling you the truth. But the bottom line is, I've been way, way gullible, way more gullible than I'd like to admit to. And the thing that bothers me, sometimes I don't have discernment with people when they're talking to me about different things. But that's why I love my Bible so much, because it is the source of truth. I, I may not be, be able to believe a politician. I may not be able to believe another human being or a situation or understand what's going on in front of me. But you know what? If I've got my word, my Bible in front of me, I've got truth. And that's what you hang your hat on. And, and the question is, how do we not be deceived? The only way that I know of to not be deceived is to already know the truth. And that's why Jesus said in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, actually I'm going to back up to Romans 8, uh, 3, ver verse 4 for, real quick. Because, again, um, the Bible is the only source of truth. And in Romans chapter 3, verse 4, Paul writes, let God be true but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words. And I, I, I thought about this many times. Let God be true. He is true. Then it says, but every man a liar. And my, I, my first, when I read that, I kind of bristled. Not me, Lord. I'm a man of truth. And I go, he goes, no, you're a liar. <laughs> How many lies you got to tell to be a liar? How many horses you got to steal to be a horse thief? Okay. One way or the other, God is always true, and we are liars. And, and I, I want to walk in truth. I want to be a man of integrity. I want, I want to be more like my God. But I can't say I'm not a liar. But God is the only one that's true. He's the only one that you can trust. And again, knowing the truth is the only sure safeguard against the lies. Jesus told his disciples in, in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, he said um, to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So he says, and, and, and again, he's talking to those that believed in him, to the Jews that believed in him. If you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. I see two important elements here to guard against falling for the deception. The first one is believing in him, believing in Jesus, having the Holy Spirit in you. I've had, when I was very first saved, and, um, and, and not real knowledgeable about God's word, I had people knocking on my door trying to present lies. They presented it as truth, but I determined later on that it was lies because they were telling me things that were contrary to the Bible. But I had the Holy Spirit kind of almost exploding out of my chest. I mean, there was this, this, this check, this, 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 the hair in the back of your neck. I'm not sure how to put it exactly, but the Holy Spirit was screaming in my head, this is not right. Now, I couldn't tell you why it wasn't right, just that I knew it wasn't right. Not because I had knowledge of the Bible, but because I had the Holy Spirit in me that was saying, this is wrong. And, and like I said, I, I couldn't tell you why. I just knew it was. 
And that's the Holy Spirit. And so that's the first key that we get here, believing in Jesus, having the Holy Spirit in you. But then he says, because said, he said this to those who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, the truth will make you free. Continuing in his word, abiding in his word, and you will gain an understanding of the truth so that when you're confronted with the lies of life of this world, you'll be able to distinguish. And maybe if you, if you study at it and work at it, you'll actually be able to point out why it's wrong, which is really cool when it happens. I, 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 I spent a lot of time trying to memorize scripture and, and worked at it and stuff, but I can't always conjure up a scripture when I want to. You know, I wish I could. Uh, I wish I could tell you all my scriptures I memorized just in rows. Like, ooh, that'd be impressive, but I can't. But you know what happens? I'm in a conversation, and sometimes you get that check in the spirit, and, and you're hearing it, and then sometimes the Lord, the Holy Spirit, you know, it's, it's an obscure verse that you memorized 12 years ago and forgotten 12 times since then, and the Holy Spirit brings this verse up, and it's, it answers the, the thing right then and there. Or you, it, this morning I'm studying, and my, my computer broke down for a while, and I was, I was reading through some stuff, and go, Lord, and he, he, he just brought scriptures to my mind. Oh, it, hey, it is there. You know? and, and it was really cool, but it was the Holy Spirit. That's why, that's why Jesus said that he's not going to leave us orphans. He was going to leave us in the hands, if you will, of the Holy Spirit, who would remind us of all the things that Jesus said, and that he would be our teacher, our instructor. And it's so cool to have the Holy Spirit right there prompting you. And so, but that's because you, you abide in Christ. That's part of abiding in him. And so these things lead to knowing the truth. Verse 17, we're going to stop here tonight. It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And so God gives good gifts to us. And, and, and these good gifts bring forth good fruit. And, and bring glory to his name. All the gifts that he gives us, by the way, we don't deserve the least of his tender mercies. When God gives you a good gift, it is his grace working in your heart and your life. And you know what? And, and the most foolish thing you can do is say, well, I did this, or you know, no. Nah. Whenever someone goes, wow, that was awesome. How'd you do that? Well, by the grace of God. <laughs> you know, by the grace of God, I, I survived today. By the grace of God, I built this or did that. It's all, if it's good, it, it's, it's from God, and it's by his grace, because he's a merciful, gracious, loving God. And so it's intended that he would be glorified in it. So why does he bless us again? It's his grace. But here's something you got to be aware of. The enemy gives gifts as well. Ever wonder why the wicked prosper? The enemy can give gifts, but there's always a hook. There's always the bait, <laughs> and underneath it, there's a hook. And you got to be very careful. You know, if it's good, then it's from God. But if it's evil, it's from the enemy. We're told in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. But the enemy adds sorrow. But here's the, here's the deal. You know, you look at every good gift and every perfect gift. What's the best gift? him. He is the best gift. I look at the many blessings in my life. I mean, God gave me a, a beautiful, wonderful wife. He gave me awesome, you know, kids and a family. He gave me a cool house and a really cool truck, you know, and a computer that works most of the time and, <laughs> and all kinds of stuff. God's given me a lot of cool things. And I'm grateful to him for that. But the best gift is him. I, 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 I've been jealous at times of the Levites. Because all the other tribes, all they got was land. <laughs> People fight over it all the time. But the Levites, God was their inheritance. They got the best gift. You know, and, and we get the best gift. We get him. He sacrificed himself on that cross for us. He is the best. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, As each one has received the gift, minister it to one another as, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. As I examine this verse... As each one has received the gift. What's the gift? I believe the gift is salvation. Minister that, minister that salvation to one another 
as good stewards. Don't take your gift and bury it in the ground, roll it up in a napkin, and put it away. When your master comes, here, master, here's what you said. I knew you were a stern master, so here, I give it back. <laughs> He'll take it back. We've been given something precious to share. And so we receive the gift, minister it one to another. The best gift is God himself. Share him with everybody you can. But every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. and comes down from the Father of light. So we acknowledge who's given the gift. With whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. One of the things that I like the best about my God, he's not capricious. He doesn't change on a dime. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you, if you, I wouldn't encourage it, but if you were to read the Quran, uh, Allah is described as being, quote, unquote, capricious. He says one thing this time, says something else the other time, and he's inconsistent. I call that a liar. <laughs> Our God is the God of truth. And I love that we get truth from him. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. He said he wouldn't consume them. They're not consumed. Why? Because he's keeping his word, because they deserve to be consumed. We deserve to be consumed. In Romans chapter 11, verse 29, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, a strong hope, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. What are those two immutable things? One, God doesn't change. Two, God doesn't lie. Otherwise, what are we doing here? Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I love that. Our God is reliable. In, a, in an ever-changing world, politics are going back and forth. Uh, who knows what's going to happen with COVID next week? You know, there's so many uncertain things. Uh, prisons are opening. Prisons are closing. Uh, who knows what they're doing? They don't know what they're doing. It uh, doesn't really matter because it's all going to fall in place in God's providential plan. And as much as I hate to see some of the things that are happening, I get kind of excited because it's like, ooh, that's really bad, Lord. That means you're coming sooner than I thought. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and he is. And he is. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your, your favor. Thank you, Lord, that every good and perfect gift does truly come from you and that you never change. Help us, Lord, simply to live for you, to, to mortify the flesh and to live in the spirit. Again, Father, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you're able, let's uh, stand together and worship.
Father God, I'd like to make big promises about all the things that we'll do and how faithful we're going to be and how much we love you. But Lord, you know the truth behind all that. And Lord, we just declare that we're willing, Lord, to, to love you. We're willing, Lord, to walk in your ways. And we want to please you. Would you pour out, Lord, your spirit upon us? And would you make those things true? Would you make it so, Lord, by your power, by your might, and for your glory? Work in the hearts of your children, Lord. We are willing, Lord, to yield to whatever you want to do. Have your way, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee, the Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his, countenance his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Well, I pray that the peace of God goes with you guys tonight, that he continues to speak to your hearts and, and just draw you closer and closer to himself that you find yourself thinking his thoughts and walking in his ways and just be a natural, wonderful, glorious thing and that he would be glorified. God bless you guys. Have a great night. If you need prayer for any reason, come on up. We'd love to pray with you.